Ein Verlust ist eine Kluft, ein Spalt, der zwischen mich und die Welt geschlagen wird. Es ist ein negativer Ort, an dem nichts mehr wächst. Eu acho que todo o meu processo de luto sempre veio com muito com tentar entender a situação. Eu quando eu tinha dois an três anos na verdade e perdi o meu avô, é, eu não entendia direito a situação ainda e meus pais eles foram para o funeral. A few years ago, my father passed away, and I remember being numb and not wanting this to be real for a long time. Looking back, his death. Oh, he died suddenly and unexpectedly in a climbing accident. Was really traumatic to me. Wenn ich trauere, wenn ich Processo de luto sempre veio com muito com tentar entender. He was suffering from depression for the longest time. Eu tinha dois anos, my dois anos na verdade, e perdi o meu avô. Que ele ia morrer sooner rather than later. Eu não entendia direito o que estava acontecendo. E meus pais eles foram para o hospital. In the wake of his death, I remember. Grief has many voices, many stories. All of us have experienced some kind of loss and grief in our lives, and if we have been so lucky to not have experienced that yet, it's very likely that experience it in the future. Uh, our narratives are unique and at the same time ubiquitous. Sharing this experience is something that all of us do. And yet we systematically learn to be silent about these experiences. We're not allowed to actively talk about it, and the, there aren't many spaces to be heard. It's something that's unspeakable. At least that's what I learned when I, like, impactfully, when I was 19 years old and I gave birth to this cutie here. And uh, that's Nicholas. Say hi to Nicholas. And uh, he, uh, he had very th uh, strong thighs and he had a very soft voice. Uh, he also had a very beautiful smell. And I took this picture of him uh, when he was about two weeks old, which was some days before um, this was found in his brain. And for all of you who aren't doctors or scientists, this uh, a bacteria, the streptococcus, uh, streptococcus bacteria, um, that caused meningitis, and these bacteria killed him in only five days. So that was in July 2004, right before I enrolled in university. And something, <coughs> it's one thing to come to terms with such an experience and such a connection um, <coughs> by myself, and to develop rituals and realize that life moves on, um, it's an altogether different thing to enter a battleground of social interaction and to realize that I was quite young and naive back then, um, wanting to share memories and experiences that connect me to my child with others. So when I entered conversations and I wanted to casually talk about my role as an ex-mother and as a, as a bereaved parent, there, there, doesn't ex there, there is no word in English to, to actually identify such a role. I felt a bit like a weirdo. Um, so I went into normal conversations, and this is how I felt when talking to normal people. Uh, I felt like I'm assaulting most of the people with uh, my story, and I, that I represented a threat. I was kind of the walking death. Um, which would make normal people turn around. And the ones that stayed in a conversation were usually the ones that had uh, <coughs> answers for me uh, for questions that I never asked. Um, because God did not really ring with me uh, back then, and I didn't take that so well, and I also hadn't asked for explanations. I just wanted my mother-child relationship to be considered normal by folks, and uh, when leaving the battleground of social expectations uh, and <clears throat> reclining in front of media, I couldn't find myself represented either. I couldn't see my experience anywhere. Uh, I actually felt like a loser, like a, a failed mom, because even 
with the help of 21st century medicine in Austria, I was not able to protect my child. And this was also something that was completely absent from the channels of, of media. So what I was going through is called, in, the, in grief literature, is called the disenfranchisement of grief. And that's a condition that's uh, referring to, a, to an experience that is not, a grief experience that's not acknowledged by an outside world, and that's therefore unspeakable. That's also very common a sen sentiment or experience among uh, grieving uh, queer people who, who grieve over a relationship that, that was not speakable uh, during life and when it's lost, and it's even worse. And it refers to this circumstance where you cannot openly live your grief or share it with others. And that is a very isolating state. This isolation only changed when I, when I found a self-help group. And uh, a self-help group for bereaved parents. And that was the first time when I didn't feel wrong because there were women like me uh, and different from me who uh, lost kids of all genders, ages, and health conditions. And uh, it was fascinating to learn that even though we were so different, we shared many feelings. Um, for instance, the wish to have our experience acknowledged, the wish to celebrate this connection to our children uh, that was tangible to us, but not really um, a conversation topic for others, an acceptable conversation topic. Uh, and then also the fact that our children do not only stand for a sort of catastrophe or end of life, but that they also were, they were also joyful parts of our experience. Uh, I learned that, for, for instance, uh, other women had developed a couple of rituals, like knitting these pajamas for their babies, um, <clears throat> or other, other rituals, that seasonal rituals, like cutting off a branch of the Christmas tree and bringing it to the grave. Um, my personal ritual is grave painting. Um, that's something that I do every half a year. And sometimes, sometimes I bring friends, family, sometimes I do it alone. Um, and in exchange with others, I found out that actually grief is ordinary. And it's something that we, we can talk about, but we need more spaces to talk about this. We need more spaces to negotiate what it means to be a brief parents. And we do want to have our children as part of a conversation of an overall umbrella category of children. So, um, <clears throat> why not make a game? Since I'm a game maker, why not make a game about grief or for grievers? So, I made Jokhoi, the game Jokhoi, as part of my PhD, um, which was a collaboration with uh, the Viennese self-help group I talked about. It's called Regenbogen, Rainbow. And the design and tech part, <coughs> for the design and tech part, I collaborated with um, Aalborg University, Copenhagen, and amazing students there. Um, and I'd like you to walk you through four steps on, on this design journey, or this design journey for me, and how we did go about uh, designing for grief. So first of all, uh, so this is the, the agenda. I'll talk about a little bit of the state of the art of uh, taking a look into how games have treated grief before. It's a real quick look, just into the tendencies. Then um, I'll talk about my own attempts of understanding grief. And then I'll go into how we worked. I worked with grievers and finally, what can be said about understanding the impact of such a design project. So, state of the art. When you look at video games, you see loss everywhere. Death and loss. One indication for this is the game over trope, uh, which is the most conventional way of uh, games telling you, go to the next level. Basically, work yourself from game over to game over. And there seems to be a lot of death and mortality here. But there's a paradox with this game over convention because 
this ubiquity of death and loss is actually silencing grief, because what's happening is the opposite of losing something. It's gaining something. You're gaining another chance at life. You're usually continuing after a game over. So, so there's an immortality loop. And so this is a very dominant convention, but you might say, okay, but there are games that have done different things already that have meaningfully addressed grief, and you're absolutely right about that. Actually, one of the games that has uh, done so in compelling ways, representing grief in compelling ways, has been made in Sweden, and it's called Brothers. Who has played Brothers? Okay, we're in Sweden. <laughs> um, massive spoilers ahead for those who haven't played it. Uh, so it's, about, it's a game about two boys going on an adventure, and one of them dies uh, at the end of the game, almost at the end of the game. What, what is essential is that because you're controlling both brothers in the game, the memory of the dead brother is essential for gameplay. The other brother, the surviving brother, remembers him and plays on in his spirit using his actual controls. Uh, so there is this notion of, or this feeling of maintaining a connection to the dead sibling and taking over the legacy, what you have learned from your bigger brother, and so I also spoiled <laughs> which brother died. Um, and so this is a kind of powerful uh, survivor narrative. It focuses on the love and the actual connection between the brothers. And you can guess the uh, um, title of the next example, that grief game. Yeah? Bingo, of course. It's that grief game, it's the, 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 the prime example. When I told people I'm doing a PhD on loss and grief, they told me, play this. This is what you, you need to play, and I did. <clears throat> now, for those of you who haven't played uh, that dragon, Cancer, it's a game where an American dad walks us through his experience of losing a son through cancer. And it's, it's played through personal vignettes based on autobiographical memories. And it features heavy, it, it heavily features uh, audio footage from family conversations. So the children and the wife also feature prominently, but the game is both marketed and handled as a dad's story. And it's his voice we get to, to hear most of the time, is his shoes we walk in. And and when I actually talked to the makers, and it turns out that Amy, the wife, was doing most of the labors around a, a child care and the son's health care. So I, I'm asking myself, when it comes to, to games, where are all the bereaved mothers in video games? Where are their stories? Until now, I haven't found any games on the production level of that Dragon Cancer and Brothers who uh, actually immerse us, immerse us into a mother-child narrative where the loss of the mother is focused as a narrative. And this leads me to the question whether grief is yet another experience which is focused through the lens of a white cis male character in games when the majority of grief experiences cannot even be suffered and lived through such a body. Just think of bonding with a baby, in, uh, which you then lose, that, that first gr grows in your womb and which you then lose, and whose presence still continues to matter in everyday life. Not only is this an exciting and challenging narrative to design, but it's a real narrative, it's, many of us live it. So for me it's quite artificial that this is a conflict, a challenge that is not presented in game narratives as it should be. But how to include it, where to start? So as a researcher, I was first trying to find models in order to understand grief systematically. So I thought that Finding a formula for grief, a tool to understand grief structurally, could help me turn it into a game, a mechanic, a, a goal, a 
clear-cut system. So I read a lot of theory, and as it turns out, uh, this guy, of all people, um, it was the first one ever in Western history to articulate a, a formula of a grief. Now, for, for, for those of you who don't know this guy, that's Sigmund Freud. Um, it's kind of like the obligatory Viennese slide. Um, and he's, he's this, uh, the founder of psychoanalysis who could only write on opium and who saw genitals everywhere uh, while claiming that his cigar is just a cigar. Um, so he wrote this essay in 1970 that's called, 1917 that's called Morning, On Morning and Melancholia. And that was groundbreaking. It's cited in all the grief literature. And the basic narrative of mourning and melancholia, the theory that he came up with on drugs, is that we can think in gr of, about grief in terms of a two-way trajectory. Now, a person experiencing loss, going through a loss, goes through one of two processes. The first one is called mourning, or a German Trauer, which is the good response. It means that you're working through loss, you're doing some grief work, you're severing, you're cutting the bonds with the dead. That is the, the grief work that you're doing. You're separating yourself. Once this job of separation is done, has been done, healing is accomplished and overcoming unlocked. The second trajectory is not so good. That's the bad grief. It's the pathological response. That's the melancholia. It is associated with a disorder, a complicated grief disorder in the, in the psychological literature. That's a condition that officially exists. It means that you can never be free from the dead, from the bond that you have, and that doesn't support you anymore because not only do you lose the other, but you also lose yourself on the way. Now, if that already sounds like a design document to you, because it's such a binary system, it, is really, it has a mechanic, it has a goal, and so on, uh, wait what the 20th century grief liter literature did. You might guess that already, in the five stages of grief, that was basically chunking the good trajectory into a set of even more specific mechanics, right? So you have five mechanics, uh, five stages towards overcoming. And uh, when I read that, I had a little bit of a weird, awkward feeling about that, that I couldn't really put my finger on what, what it actually was. Uh, so I made a game about it. I made a game that's purely based on the rhetoric of grief, of, of grief work and grief literature. And it's called Overcoming. Um, it's uh, like my ambition was to make it look like an a illustration from a psychology book. So uh, there's a goal uh, that's overcoming and you have a progress bar. Uh, you have the mechanic of cutting bonds between you and the bereaved and you have cutting instruments. I made all the assets myself. Um, and uh, so you have the cut, cutting instruments available according to the stage that is sort of given. Uh, and you can grieve right uh, in, the, so in a certain time window when you, when you manage that you, uh, you have overcome. And then there's a negative, the possibility to fail at that by not being fast enough cutting bonds. So this is the time window that actually exists in the grief literature. Um, yeah, it's a bit simplistic and there's a lot of things that are wrong with this game. But maybe the most important thing that's wrong is that what's missing here is an explanation why the bond exists. There's the premise that you have a, to cut the bond, but what is the bond made out, out of and why should you cut it? And I'm, through making this game, I realized that this is something that's missing in the grief literature. That's missing in the grief theory. It starts from the point of loss, not the point of love. This is the reason why I started from the beginning and I wanted to invite grievers to work with me. So, 
because I had this link to the self-help group and they trusted me, I thought, why not use that link and design with them? And make something that's maybe a bit less formulaic, maybe that's a bit less systematic, but that involves love as well. So when I asked the self-help group, do you want to work with me? They were very enthusiastic, but they were also slightly worried because they said, look, we want to be represented. We want to have, as you know, the space to talk about our grief and to commemorate our kids, but we, we're not really interested in video games. <laughs> video games, I mean, this is what video games are, right? They perpetuate violence. They are for neglected kids, um, but kids nonetheless. Uh, what do we do with them, they said. So my challenge was, as a designer, taking them seriously in their feeling that they didn't want anything to do with video games, but still finding a way to make a game with them. So what, what did I do next? I had to distract them from the notion of video games that they had in their heads. Uh, yes, as an animation as well. I, uh, I wanted this to happen. I wanted them to not think about video games and think about themselves. Get them into the U zone. Away from this product fetishism, the idea that blah, we need to do this game. I had to shift attention towards trust, towards being comfortable, and towards the reason why I involved them, because they were experts on grief, and I wanted to tap the grief, their grief expertise. I was the designer, they were the grief experts. So it was all about making a cozy space and surprising them with something that they did not expect at all. I built this space. Um, and making it at as little video gamey as possible, this collaboration, to fire, also fire up the lateral thinking and this is maybe something that is not so well documented in the design literature. When you look at design, game design literature, there's not so much thinking about involving others and finding ways of working with people who don't like video games. That's something we have to invent right now, as Spree Code does it as well. Um, so, but I found two sources that were extremely helpful to me. And these approaches were first Rila Kalet's Muse-based game design. So what's that? Um, the Muse-based game design approach is an experimental game design method which thinks of designers and participants in terms of an artist-muse relationship. So uh, uh, the game designers take the role of the, of the artist and as such have the responsibility over design or creating something. The job of the muse is... What is the job of the muse? is to float around and have experiences and be inspiring, right? Be free, basically. Um, <clears throat> and the job of the artist slash game designer is to react, respond to this inspiration, respond to this inspiration appropriately and amuse the muse. So there's some kind of giving and taking going on that is maybe not what do you expect from traditional models of game design? The, the, muse, the freedom of the muse is that, that brought me to the next challenge. So, the muses can be free, fine. But how do I put them into a... a or, or make them comfortable enough to share their experiences and how can they tap into a complex issue like their own grief? Sometimes it's difficult to talk about these issues, as, as Doris also said yesterday. It's easier to describe what it feels like to be in such a relationship with a dead child through metaphors, analogies, images, perhaps. So it turned out that the second uh, approach that was really helpful for me was the metaphorical game design, the deep game design that Doris talked about yesterday. And so to, to briefly revise, Metaphors are something that uh, turn something abstract in something, into something concrete by using images. 
and it can be a tool for game designers too about, uh, to speak about their experiences. Actually, seeing Doris talk about this game, Elude, which is about depression and modeling depression in terms of the metaphors up and down, was extremely inspiring for me to even start my PhD project. And I also had the pleasure to work with her and learn a little bit more about the process of building this metaphorical game design process uh, by uh, visiting her at DePaul University and working with her students. One thing that I learned is that this method is great to start from your, where you are in terms of your own experiences because you're privileging an experience that exists right now over some ideal game experience in the future. And you're slowly transforming the experience from where you are towards a play experience, towards a game system first and then a play experience. I also learned from the students and what they came up with during class that associations and personal images are wildly different. And in my case, I wanted to activate the groupthink and some kind of collective imagination. So I had this challenge to somehow get this group together and develop metaphors that would, could interact with, with, with each other. So, I designed a method for that. And to show you what I did, I would like to involve you in a little <laughs> exercise, if you're up for it. Are you up for it? Sure. Yeah. So, I would like to walk you through the imagination process that we did. And for that, I would like you to sit up tall. And uh, either close your eyes or fixate uh, the white spot in front of you. And take a deep breath in and out. Now, think of someone that you loved and lost. It might be a friend, it might be a lover, a family member, a pet. And now you're, you're traveling to visit this someone where they live right now. Imagine that they live on a planet. A space, this is a planet that only you can visit. So what do you see, how does the planet look like? What do you hear? Who else is there? What else is there? What's the atmosphere? What can you do there? Is there something that you can do or must do? And is there something that you cannot do? What happens tomorrow on this planet? Is it the same? Is there some change? Now, if, you're, if your eyes are still closed, I would like you to open them now and remind you of what you just did and your amazing minds. <laughs> um, you just moved from a very abstract idea of loss to a very concrete image of what this connection to who you lost feels like. That's your achievement. Um, you found images, you found uh, 
laws. And these images are, might be very, these planets that you came up might be very, very different. They're unique expressions of what you're going through. But these planets have something in common. They have a landscape, a terrain, they have laws, it is something that you can do and cannot do. They, perhaps they have other NPCs, people, animals, plants, whatever, that live on this planet. There is a mood and aesthetic, so visuals, audio. Uh, so you have a grief, grief game. So you can actually go home and make it now, if you so wish. Uh, but you, you might want to stay and, and see what the women made from this, out of this exercise. And what they did to, to create a kind of shared galaxy that we could put in the room and, and cross, compare, or, or just observe features of each planet. So, first planet is this scenario. A sheep looking across a river. It's a very green planet. It's a perfect holiday destination, as the author said. And there's this river separating the sheep from from her son. The river itself is a symbol for grief. And once upon a time, it was created by the tears of the lamb, uh, of, the, of the mother sheep. Now it's perfectly peaceful and normal. So what does the sheep do? It's maintaining eye contact with the other side. And there's some kind of attention, careful attention, observation. The sheep is assuring herself that the kid is well well off over there, um, protected by another dead family member. And we had this conversation about what can the, the sheep do now? Uh, why does it stay there? Why doesn't it move across the river? Is it dangerous for the sheep to cross the river? Uh, then it turns out there's perhaps a flock in the background that is, that is actually something the sheep is also attached to. Uh, and by the way, the sheep is completely content with its observer position. So there was this conversation around transformation and this yearning to be with the child, but also to stay with the family in the here. Uh, the second model was a fluffy cave, uh, full of family members and friends, and the collective task in this cave was to visit the baby that was located in the very inner cave, in the very fluffy inner white space. And the tasks that the family member had, had to do was to take care and nurture the baby to make it strong, grow and survive and be left behind in the inner cave. So the objective of this planet was to leave the planet in a spaceship when this nurturing process was done. There was no time pressure here, it was just about giving enough space and time for the family members to contribute their, uh, their activity or, or their task to this collective project of making the baby grow up. And then there's, uh, there's the bliss, what I call a bliss planet, because there was freedom on this planet. Everything was beautiful, everything was possible. There were different seasons that, that changed from cloudy, sunny, rainy, snowy, but none of that was threatening. And actually, this planet was designed to pre prevent a view on the reality of loss. You can see the, the paper um, uh, uh, part of this model is shining through a bit um, under the felt, and this is the reality that we need to prevent from shining through. But it shows itself a bit. Um, and then the fourth model, uh, yes, the fourth model was uh, a, a big fireside, a campfire at night, and the ra racing moon on the night sky. Around the fireside, there are shards and treasures scattered around, and they represent the good and the challenging parts of the experience. The flames illuminated different parts of this reality, and the parents sat around the campfire and had, having different perspectives on these shards and treasures. So there was this theme of finding something that's hidden, a treasure that you don't maybe see because 
the other partner can see it, but you can't see it, and you then switch perspectives. So there's also the p potential for conflict among the parents. Now, how did we go about implementing these images? There are pretty models. That is, I mean, that was surprising that all of these planets were basically utopian scenarios, and that they're expressive of the love that is there between the mothers and their children, and that the overall theme of attachment and love was so relevant. So the themes that we took out of these models were care feeding, being present, and the notion of timelessness, so meditative mode. But I also wanted to make a grief game, not only a game about attachment, but also about grief, and translate that into actual gameplay. So in my book, it had to be a game which lets you explore the mother-child bond first, and then it throws you into a world in which this connection can no longer be realized. So one image that really resonated with us was the sheep theme. Um, we made a little story in which you play as a mother feeding the baby on the meadow um, before an earthquake takes it away from you. And uh, there's a simple control scheme, left and right mouse button. We wanted to say that you can care for yourself with the right mouse button, but that caring for the baby in this moment is more important. And since the left mouse button is something that's conventionally used more, this is how you care. So you, how do you care? Uh, a couple of mechanics. First of all, if you press left rather than right, you skip around enthusiastically around, uh, on the meadow. Uh, the la lamb follows you wherever you go. There's some kind of intuitive, uh, unconditional love. And togetherness is natural. Secondly, when you press left on a flower on the meadow, you pick it up and feed it. And so by feeding it, you also leave a little imprint on the lamb's fur. So the decisions you make matter, and you can dress it up and customize it a bit, like a making a parental choice. And another aspect is when you, when you feed the child, it also the music has a sound that gets imprinted in the audio landscape of the level, so it's enriching. You can also cuddle with your, your flock, and that makes the seasons change, like in this one model. Um, but at a random point in time, there uh, happens an earthquake, and the game changes uh, forever. The most important change after the earthquake is that the lamb is gone. So you're alone here, and that also means that the, the flock is still there, but the lamb is gone. And that also means that you left the care function of the left, left mouse button. You lost it. And the controls for care are gone. Instead, you make a little despaired noise. Um, but when you remember the right mouse button, which you have forgotten about before, you can interact with the level, and you can actually look across the river um, and see something, something like you see this, which is some kind of wolf. Uh, dressed up in what seems to be parts of, the, of your lamb's fur. Is it your lamb in a different body? Do you want to get it back? Uh, if you try to go there, this is what happens. You get the let go screen and you are uh, landed back into, onto the meadow. Um, when you get back into the meadow, uh, the flowers which used to be bright um, where are we yes so the flowers which used to be visible are covered in grass and so that that stands for this this is now from uh, from a previous phase but you can imagine that every all the flowers are covered with grass and so that means that the uh, act of care has become a very vulnerable thing for you, and it's invisible from the, uh, for the outside world, uh, invisible by the outside world. And uh, it's, you have to uncover the flowers bit by bit by means of, by acts of self-care, which means internalizing the grass, uh, basically digesting the experience, 
um, and eating the flowers allows you to take in and internalize the care and remember the melody that you have built up with your lamb. So, that's the game. <laughs> Heavy. Um, this is loaded with symbolism. It's what you might call an allegorical game. So there's the layer of the sheep game and then there's this layer of, of this additional meaning of, of the grief narrative. Uh, so there's the opportunity to project a lot, but did players get it? That's the question. What impact did it have? And for me, the most important audience for this game was indeed the muses, the grievers that I wanted to amuse with this game. The, we made it for them, so did they like it? Were they amused? And this is where it gets interesting and a bit non-trivial. Because interpretations of the muses are uh, different widely. One example is the wolf on the other side of the river. For some of the muses, this was definitely the lamb in a different body. One player reported in shock, oh, that's my child. Uh, how can I get it back? This was a bit in line with our intention, so it's the kind of correct interpretation, right? But the second, for the second part of the music, uh, for the second half, the wolf was definitely an enemy who had killed the lamb. And most likely it had eaten it. So that was not intended, but is it wrong? Does it mean that the communication goal of the game were, was not met? Um, let me answer by pointing to one commonality in all the answers, in all the responses. All the muses felt that the game represented their personal loss experience. That, that one possibility of why they said that is that they wanted to be uh, uh, polite and give me a white lie, so and compliment the design of the project de team and wanted us to feel good. But on the other hand, they gave it a us a lot of uh, stuff to, to think about, a lot of uh, um, they made a lot of requests, they gave us a lot of work, they wanted us to, to uh, put in a little tutorial and things like that. So it's, the, is it likely that they lied in this question? I don't think so. So how is it possible that a game, at the same time a game receives different interpretations and feels right to different players? It resonates with different experiences. How is that possible? Shouldn't there be like one meaning? The answer is no. It's actually quite straightforward because providing the story arc of love and loss through the mechanics and this attachment and the sudden separation is one thing, but Jokoi, the game, is also leaving space for projection uh, which allows players to see their own stories in the game. And they can make meanings that fit their own narratives. So it's up to them. And one lesson that I learned that ambiguity was actually quite helpful because it was a matter for me, a, a matter of respect towards the collaborators. It was a tool to acknowledge the diversity of their grief experiences. And it allowed different players to project emotions like guilt Maybe not saving the lamb from the wolf, feeding the wrong flowers was also one response. Poisoning the lamb. Um, that these were effects that we did not intend. But as designers, isn't it sometimes beautiful to see that your work generates meaning that you did not anticipate? Rather than being an omniscient problem solver all the time, who fixes the issues of players, wouldn't it be more lovely and respectful to treat pl players as humans with the ability to think, play, and fix their issues themselves? In an ordinary conversation, you wouldn't want to predic predict the answers of your conversation partners, would you? And you, you wouldn't, probably, because that's boring. <laughs> Why, then? When wearing a game designer hat, would you want to predict the final meaning of your game? 
So when it comes to grief, designing for grief, it became obvious to me that everyone has their story to tell and no game about grief can tell users what to feel about that because they already know. They're experts. So how can we then design for grief? What's the actual design problem? For me, the problem to be solved is to curate a space that matters for grievers. And the question, how can I add real life experiences by including the expertise of grievers? I must say that the method of muse-based design in combination with, with the uh, metaphorical game design really worked for me. Because the muse-based design is a way to divide responsibilities in the design process, to include people that are afraid of games to begin with, and to perhaps distract from this alienation that some audiences have with games, and they have rightfully have with games. Isn't that a path forward, a way towards innovation? That because if you make a game that actually amuses them, there is no way around coming up with something completely different from the mainstream. Secondly, the metaphorical game design has helped us to tap into the here and now of where the experience is happening. It allows you to tap inner landscapes and to transform them into game systems. Perhaps the most important lesson for, from grief-based game design is its capacity to open up a space in which you feel comfortable sharing your intimate experiences through the process of game design. A space in which we, me, us, felt visible as bereaved parents a space in which we existed and therefore our relationships with our kids existed, in which our experiences were not unspeakable. Uh, we have deserved such a space where we can be, where we can speak, and your voice is heard by the efforts of game designers. In order to make many more so-called unspeakable experiences speakable, it needs our, all, our joint efforts. So if you are up for the challenge, I hope that this presentation gave you a little starting point. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not sure whether that's time for questions. Yes? Yes, it is. Hi, uh, great speech, um, one of my favorites this far. Um, I just wanted to ask about, um, because when you were speaking about grief, you were talking about the unrequested love for the person you have lost, but there are many complex ways of grief. Um, I'm going to take my own example of it because I don't know how else to put it. Uh, I had an alcoholic and abusive father who died when I was 18 years old. Um, I haven't met him for three years, but I still feel a severe loss for him. Um, the, the struggle when you had the example with the imagine the place you would go to and the loss of the planet, I couldn't do that. I weren't able to do that. Not because I think I have come over the grief for him, but I have still, have still have problems with it because of the very complex relationship we had that we weren't only based on love, which we had when we were, I were younger, but was lost upon the way and turned into hatred and love. Um, how would you go about making these very complex other relationship, because it, yeah. I, I don't know where I wanted to take the question. I just wanted to ask how to design around these very, very, very complex yes. patterns. Yes, this is an excellent question. 
Thank you so much for this and sharing your experience. Um, I think that, and this is, oh, you tapped into a, a little bit of a blind spot in terms of this setup that we chose with the planets. For, because I knew the women a little bit, I, most of the women I didn't know, but I knew that they were going to the self-help group because of their yearning to realize the connection to their, their children and have this love relationship. So that was kind of a given, right? Um, so, so I started designing the planet exercise from this, you know, premise of love. But it is an excellent point, or rather a question for everyone to think about what spatial metaphor would work better if that starting condition wasn't love, but if it was, because it's dangerous to visit a space where there's, um, what, which is not a safe space in your case, which is, which is full of this ambiguous, like almost like da a dangerous space, right? Yeah. Um, so what would be a good way of both visiting that place and, sh and protecting yourself from going too far? Like, I don't know. Would, could you imagine maybe, I don't know, could you imagine a space for that? The only thing that I came into was a large room filled with smoke. My father was also a smoker. Um, and the constant smell of wine, because he was drinking wine. And how I was just in that room carrying a gas mask trying to find him, because I had to wear the gas mask for my own security. That was the only picture I could get up in my head, and I could never find him. Wow. But this is powerful. Like, why not work with that? <laughs> Um, but yeah, great speech really made me think, and I think that it's really important to see these kinds of connections of how to yeah. find places. Thank you so much. And <laughs> just as a reminder, when I, when I gave a version of this talk at, at TDC, um, one of my friends went off uh, afterwards and started designing a game uh, based on her images from this exercise. So if you have a very strong image that came up now, uh, please make a game about it. And if you do it, please share it with me because we need more spaces uh, in which these narratives are told. So uh, yeah, if that is an outcome of that talk, it'll be, that would be awesome. Thank you. So hey, um, all right. Uh, when I was 11 years old, I lost my father. And uh, I figured out pretty quickly that my way of dealing with the grief was to talk about it, uh, talk about it openly with friends and family. And it worked effectively, effectively for me. Uh, but I realized over time that talking to people who has not previously experienced grief yielded a different reaction that I would want. I noticed that people reacted with fear and pity rather than understanding. I have this uh, example story of, I used to work at a supermarket uh, during the summer and um, we had this really tall guy at work and we were talking about his height and my father used to be really, high, uh, really tall as well. I said that, yeah, but my father was two meters tall almost, was. Uh, is the way. I just said it commonly, I didn't think much about it because, you know, that's the way I've dealt with it. I just talk about it. His reaction was that he jokingly said, was, <laughs> what, did he lose his legs or something? And I was like, no, um, he's dead. And uh, he reacted with total fear. He didn't know what to say. Mm -hmm. He was, you know, just stopped right there in the moment like, oh God, I'm so sorry. And I realized there and then that I didn't think much about it myself because I had dealt with it. But the reactions of others yeah. uh, is what gets to me. Yes. When I talk about my father, I'm more afraid of how people will react than how I will react to it. Yes. Yes, uh, absolutely. Like that was exactly what I wanted to say with this disenfranchisement and the me becoming more and more, um, yes, reluctant to talk about something I would talk about casually. 
exactly. And I would just grow jealous of other parents being able to talk about their children and their deliveries, uh, <laughs> like and their birth experiences, just because the kids are alive. Yes, and um, it kind of feels like you're walking, uh, like people are walking a minefield, uh, minefield yes. when they're talking to you. Yes. And I think that an issue with society and such is the lack of understanding of loss and grief. Mm -hmm. And you raised this at the beginning of your talk. Yeah. Uh, if these two talks that I gave at this conference have something in common, it has to do with the unspeakability of, of issues and it has to do with uh, my actually ambition to see a change or also contribute to a change in, in regards to making uncomfortable experiences less uncomfortable, right? Yes. So normalizing things that are considered off topic. Yeah, I feel like this talk was mu uh, very much about, you know, how people who have experienced grief can find some place to talk about it. But what could you do to instead uh, shift the focus onto how to make grief socially acceptable mm -hmm. in the society and making it less taboo to talk about, yeah. and making it common? And I think one contribution, uh, one way of doing that is through uh, making more cultural artifacts that deal with these experiences in ordinary ways. I like video games. <laughs> yes! <laughs> well, uh, that's all for me. Thank you. Hello, Sabrina. Hi. My name is Lena Sorsi Emilsson. Uh, your talk was both em emotional and intellectual for me, touching. Uh, I work today with technology to get it out to people so it can help their biological system and neurobiologist in the bottom. And I'm not a gamer. I'm here because I see the potential of games and I want to understand it. And your talk made it clear to a certain degree for me, so I'd like to thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to bring you back to what I do in my profession. And I want to ask you, because I want new innovations to get out to he people so it actually can help them to live a higher qualitative life. Most of the cases, people that have a brain injury and spinal cord, in my case, but it's also emotional and cognitive things that comes with it. Have you taken your creations, your work, into clinical settings? No. Um, that would be the next step. This is a very fresh research project that okay. just completed it literally weeks ago, so. Okay. Yeah. Uh, because that my follow-up question would have been there, what your reaction have been, what, you know, how people have addressed this tool to work with people. But I will give you my card later on if you don't have an answer and we can talk. Yes, I would whenever. love that. Yes, um, yeah. I mean, this is also, what you just said resonated with our, the last meeting I had with the, my collaborators, um, with the muses, uh, the mm. women, who said that they would love this game to be, be part of a, of a setting, of a self-help setting, mm. in which it is actually used as facilitating material, something to have a discussion about. Yeah. So, uh, because there are so many feelings coming up while playing that game, talking about the narrative of the sheep and how it might represent issues that are currently pressing yeah. um, in a playful way and in a way that is not too, uh, too much evoking the trauma. Um, that was something that, that the, the collaborators stressed as a potential use of this game. But I haven't gone into uh, exploring mm. that more. Uh, something I meet a lot is um, when I work with engaged citizens, we, we like to refer to a lot of these people as pa uh, lead patients today, people who are working for health for others. One of the big things that comes with it is actually to get a proper understanding from the profession, because the profession has one idea about what life quality and health is, and the people living yes. in it has a completely different one. Yeah. And this is very hard equation to get together, even you know, when we put in one factor till, which is the decision makers. Yes. So uh, I thank you very much. Thank you.
Any further questions? Well, if they come up later, I'm here. You can ask me later. And I think it's dinner. Uh, dinner, not dinner. Lunch now, right? It's lunchtime. You need to go.